The world of Minecraft is very rich and complex, with many interesting things to find. Ancient structures fill this place, thriving villagers and evil illagers, sunken ships and decrepit nether portals. The game has a past and a present. The world we find ourselves in has a story. Yet, there's one part of this story which I have not yet explored. There are discs that can be found in various places. They contain music when put in a jukebox. Why do these discs exist like this in the world? Who wrote and recorded these, and why is the player able to find them? Welcome to Deep Dive, a series where we've slowly been uncovering the secrets of Minecraft. Tonight, we are going to tackle a subject which I have been avoiding due to its complexity. The music discs are a very challenging topic, as we'll soon see. But I can't run forever. It's time to take a look and see what's going on. Hopefully, our analysis will uncover the purpose and story behind the music discs. Join me for a dive beneath the waves. The music discs in Minecraft are an incredibly tricky subject to analyze. To have any chance of getting to the bottom of this mystery, we're going to need to define an important word, which is diegetic. Although the term diegetic sounds complicated, it's actually fairly simple to understand. Diegetic refers to sound heard within the world as part of the action. Another way to think about it is that it's a sound that can be heard by characters. For example, if a creeper explodes, it's going to make a loud noise. This explosion is clearly produced by an origin within the game, and would thus be audible to other entities. Most sounds heard within Minecraft are like this. Mining a block. Lighting a fire. The groan of a zombie. All of these have a clear source within the context of the Minecraft universe. Thus, they would be described as diegetic. However, there's a contrasting sound type, which is a non-diegetic sound. This type of noise cannot be heard in-universe. A simple example of this is the clicking of the menu buttons. Although it's useful for the audience, it exists outside the fiction of Minecraft. Non-diegetic sounds are used extensively in filmmaking. In most movies, the soundtrack is non-diegetic. There isn't an in-universe source to the music. We don't see any orchestra or conductors during a Star Wars fight. Rather, the music exists outside of the story, and is instead designed to communicate with the audience. Minecraft has non-diegetic music as well. Most of the soundtrack plays at random intervals, with no clear source. Its purpose is very similar to the film score. It communicates the mood to the audience, which, in this case, is the person looking at the screen. Yet, the interesting thing is that Minecraft does have some music which is clearly diegetic. These are, of course, the music discs. By finding a disc and putting it into a jukebox, music plays from that specific block. As we move further away, it gets quieter, and we can hear where the sound is coming from, just like any other diegetic sound in the game. The result of this is an important point worth mentioning. Music discs have music that physically exists within the scope of Minecraft. It's in the game world, not simply overdubbed for the audience. That distinction is important. However, things become complicated once we examine the music discs. There are 13 different options, and by mousing over, we can see that each of them has a name. For example, the disc with the white label is Strad, by C418, and the orange disc is Pigstep, by Lena Rain. The obvious question is, how should we interpret these labels? Did C418 and Lena Rain literally exist somewhere in the Minecraft universe, and then create these labeled discs? In this case, the answer is pretty clearly no. The composers are not intended to be characters within the canon. Rather, it's an attribution, so that the real-life composers are credited. What's a little bit trickier is what should we do about the names? Are the titles of the tracks known within the universe, or is it also simple attribution? If we look through the titles, many do seem to be consistent with Minecraft. There are cats and blocks, and piglins within the nether. Yet others have a less distinct connection, such as Maul and Mellowhigh. At this point, it's hard to know for sure if these names are in-universe or not. Perhaps taking a look at the musical content will help. Remember, these discs are diegetic, so any sounds coming from them should exist canonically within the game. However, we quickly run into some issues. For example, Ward quotes Chopin's Funeral March. Although the key has been shifted from B-flat minor to D minor, it's pretty obvious that this is intended to be a reference. Chirp has a similar issue. The opening sequence is a sample from the Optigen, 
an electronic keyboard from the 1970s. But we're hearing this music diegetically in the Minecraft universe. Does that mean that Chopin existed in Minecraft or the Optigan? In fact, so many of the synthesized sounds found on the music discs have no known equivalent in Minecraft. Did the Mellotron featured in Mellow High exist somewhere in the world? You may be starting to see the issue here. We know that music discs are diegetic, yet when we try and figure out how those specific sounds were produced, we run into a wall. There's a dissonance. Diegetic sounds exist in-game with no known way for them to have actually been produced in-game. If we want to move forward, the unfortunate solution is to just accept the music discs as they are. We need to ignore the real-world connections and references and instead approach the music from a formalist perspective, as an isolated work within the game. In other words, we can't think too much about how these actual sounds were made. Despite this issue, it does seem as though music production would be feasible in the Minecraft world. For example, note blocks exist, which can produce a wide variety of sounds. From a technological perspective, sound recording is not out of reach. In real life, the earliest recordings were done acoustically using wax cylinders. A needle inscribed the vibrations of sound into a physical form. The process could then be reversed. Physical grooves would produce sound vibrations. Eventually, this changed to recording grooves on a flat wax disc. From there, copies of the disc could be produced. These copies were made of shellac, which is a resin found on trees. In theory, none of this really seems to conflict with the level of technological advancement seen in Minecraft. Another detail is that the jukebox is created using a diamond. Turntables often have a diamond tip stylus, which appears to be consistent with the crafting recipe. Nonetheless, it would require a high degree of intelligence to produce something like this. If you've seen any of my previous deep dives, I've often talked about an extinct humanoid group called the Ancient Builders. The evidence for their existence is immense. I've argued that they constructed the pyramids, and their loot is found throughout the Minecraft world. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, check out the above link. These ancient builders had knowledge of redstone, and would be a good candidate for the composers. In practice, it's not quite so simple, and the main reason has to do with where the discs are found. Out of the 13 possibilities, only 3 are found within chests. This includes Cat and 13, which are in dungeons and mansions, as well as Pigstep, which is in Bastion Remnants. Dungeon loot is very similar to loot from other ancient builders, with items like horse armor and golden apples. Yet, the discs occur in mansions as well. And the illagers who live in these mansions are also incredibly intelligent, having discovered the secrets of life and death through the Totem of Undying. Despite this, it's bizarre that the exact same discs exist in totally different places. The nature of dungeons is mysterious as it is, and we just don't see any reason for the illagers to trek so far underground. Furthermore, the dungeons are in a state of decay, if they were actively in use by the illagers, then they would likely be the pristine works of architecture, like the mansions. So how do these discs end up in two totally different spots? And we still haven't mentioned the third disc, Pigstep, which is also found in a specific location. As explained in my Piglin video, the ancient builders did have access to the nether, and they built the bastions. But why would there be a disc specifically for the bastion? Is it an anthem of their mining progress in the nether? Is it a work song? We can't really know for sure. Even now, we're finding that these discs tend to resist a logical explanation. But we're currently only looking at three discs. Things get much, much worse when we discover how the other ten discs are found. They will never occur in any chest. Rather, the other discs can only be found when a creeper is killed by a skeleton arrow. Let's break this one down. It means that a disc must exist in every single creeper in the world. Somehow, the technological marvel of recorded audio has made its way into one of the most common mobs in the game. However, killing this mob with a sword causes the disc to be destroyed. The creeper exploding causes the disc to be destroyed. Even killing it with our own arrow destroys the disc. No, the only way for 10 of the 13 discs to be found is if a very specific mob kills a creeper. There is zero evidence that skeletons use a different type of bow and arrow setup than the player. In fact, a skeleton can drop both its arrows and its bow. Yet, even by picking these up, killing the creeper destroys the music disc. It has to be a skeleton firing the arrow. The exact same setup fails if the player tries it. How does the creeper know that it wasn't a skeleton arrow? This has no logical explanation. There's nothing physically different. 
I'm racking my brain here, and I cannot seem to find a self-consistent logic that allows a phenomenon like this to occur. Every component of it makes no sense, from the secret disc in all creepers to the obscure drop condition. I've made a YouTube career by doing deep dives, which are fundamentally based on examining the evidence and taking it to its logical conclusions. But this creeper disc problem has no logical conclusion. It requires the creeper to have some type of knowledge about what killed it, which it could not reasonably obtain. So we find ourselves at a crossroads when it comes to interpreting these discs. Constructing a rational explanation for their physical location is not easy to do, unless we are willing to take a massive leap of faith. From that perspective, the obvious answer is that the discs in the creepers are easter eggs. They're a cool item to find, but not intended to show the lore. If that is indeed the case, then how do we interpret the three discs that can be found in chests? Well, our previous logic continues to hold. It's reasonable to expect that the ancient builders or illagers might have had recording technology. Yet the specific methodology for these discs ending up in these chests remains an unsolved mystery. Suddenly, we remember that tricky issue about Chopin and the synthesizers that we chose to ignore. And when we stop and look at where we are, we realize that there are so many facts that we either cannot easily explain or are required to ignore in order to progress. And if 10 discs are already totally illogical, how much more are we willing to overlook in order to find a solution to the final three? But then there's the counter-argument. The fact remains that these discs are diegetic. It's not background music, they exist physically within the Minecraft world and are played using a crafted jukebox. To further complicate things, discs 11 and 13 are not music. Instead, they're sound effects which tell a story. One could very well argue that this is intended as lore. If not, then why have such creepy and provocative noises? Yet one could also ask how these sounds were even recorded. Is the person running carrying a phonograph while attempting to escape? It almost doesn't matter which side we choose, we still lose. If the discs exist from a lore perspective, then there are issues with their placement as well as the musical content. On the other hand, if the discs are pure easter eggs, then why are they diegetic? And what's the point of discs 11 and 13? Is it somehow possible that both things are true? Could the discs be primarily designed as easter eggs, yet still offer some lore insight? Here are my thoughts. After examining the evidence and context, I'm forced to believe that, despite their diegetic nature, the physical Minecraft music discs are not canon. My investigations have not yielded a satisfying explanation. Throughout this video, we've been making assumption after assumption. Nonetheless, I don't want to totally close the door on the significance of 11 and 13. I can still see a possibility of these discs containing some type of lore information. Even if they couldn't easily exist in the world, the audio still might be useful. My theories tend to be practically focused, so something like this is admittedly a bit uncomfortable for me. But the discs are so strange that it seems foolish to throw them out simply because of their lack of practicality. However, to really explore this would probably take its own video. Now, this is probably not a satisfying conclusion. I know that a lot of you who clicked on this were hoping for something a lot spicier, such as the creepers being artificially constructed long distance communication and explosive hybrid devices. And there's certainly a temptation for me to create an explanation just for the sake of it. But I can't do that. I'm not going to make a theory more interesting than the facts suggest. Part of understanding the Minecraft lore is realizing that some things don't have a crazy, thumbnail ready explanation. And in my explorations, I simply cannot find a practical solution for the music discs that satisfies my evidence-first approach. In my view, music discs are just something fun to find and play. This is, without a doubt, one of the trickiest deep dives I've ever done. I had to rewrite the script a few times, and even now, I could be totally off base. With this video especially, I want to know what you think. Please comment down below if this rather boring conclusion makes sense to you. I could very well be incorrect here, but I'm just not seeing a logical way for this to work. So if you think you have something, I would really like to hear it. Even though I couldn't find it, doesn't mean that an explanation doesn't exist. If you think you have one, please tell me. You can also come over to the Retro Gaming Now Discord or post it on the subreddit. We have some great conversations there and I'd like to hear your voice. The important thing is that we have a discussion and get more ideas out there. We will go ahead and end with that. This has been Retro Gaming Now. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Have a great day.